This is a new experience for me. <clears throat> uh, this is the first time I've talked to a group about something that's not physics, because usually I talk about physics. Uh, now I'm going to talk about what it was like to be a physics teacher at City College and how wonderful it was. I started in 1964, retired in 2000. Wonderful, wonderful life. As soon as I got here, I was a success. <laughs> I remember putting my feet up on the table on my desk. I, they gave me an office. <laughs> Lights, chalk, room down at the end of the hall, all paid for, parking lot outside, faculty only, <laughs> faculty sticker on my car. I could park my car, walk up the hill, come into my office, there it was. Let's see, what time do I go on? Walk down the hall, open the doors, nirvana. <laughs> and they paid me <laughs> for 32 years. Oh, I was a success because I escaped the lot of the working class. One of my colleagues was a failure in life because he only became a community college physics teacher. I was a success in life because I became a community college physics teacher. Different attitude. But when I came here, it was wonderful. And before I came here, I came here at the age of 34. And uh, didn't start college until I was 28 years old. I was a late bloomer. And <clears throat> when I was in graduate school, it was the first time I had to get in front of people and talk. I, always, I used to be shy. I'm not shy now. I used to be shy. And I remember <clears throat> as a graduate assistant, that's when I would be able to get in front of students and talk about the problems that the professor would give from some physics lecture. And the first day of class began on a, began on a Tuesday, and there was no lecture. So I knew that there wouldn't be a so-called recitation section because there'd be nothing to talk about. So I showed up, and uh, my friend said, oh, you, your, your class is at 10 o'clock, Hewitt. I thought, no, 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 no. It's, no, my class is on Thursday because there's no lecture in front of it. No, 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 you've got to talk today. Talk, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not prepared. Well, just go in and talk about vectors or something like that. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I couldn't stand in front of a whole lot of people and talk because I had nothing to say. And one of the things I abhorred as a student was having to sit in classes where the professor had nothing to say and the talk, 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 talk. And there's no real content. Boy, I didn't want to become one of them. So I refused to teach the class. Someone else pitched it for me. Then Thursday came. What's the, what's the professor talking about? Had all my notes, da 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 da. I go on at 10 o'clock. So it actually it was 10 past 10. So what I did is I kept pacing around because I didn't want to come in and start talking and then people come in because I would not handle that. So I got there about 30 seconds late and I kept going to the bathroom. Do you know how, like, you come into a house and a dog is kind of nervous and it kind of pees on the floor? <laughs> Well, that's what I did. <laughs> I got in front of the class, and there was a podium like this. Thank God, there was a podium. There was a podium, no microphone, small room. And I peed my pants. <laughs> Scout's honor. I was so terrified, talking to all these people. I peed my pants. I was so nervous. And I finished everything that I had to say in about 25 minutes. And what did I do? Class is dismissed. And I, learned, I didn't know what to do. So the fact that I was so nervous and insecure and shy turned out to be something very, very wonderful for me. Because what it meant was I just couldn't go in and start rapping like I'm doing now. I couldn't do that. 
I didn't have the confidence to do that. So I, I, I knew that, for example, if no matter how shy you are, if the building is burning down, you can go up and say, hey, the place is on fire. Let's get out of here, everybody. You can do that. Because what you're saying is extensional to the audience. What you're saying is valuable. They want that information. So you don't have to be shy about that. If you're giving information that is wanted, that is valued, hey, you can do it. So being shy, I prepared like a madman for my courses. And when I came to City College, this is my first teaching assignment, I was uh, <clears throat> instructed to teach the course that other people didn't want to teach. It was called Descriptive College Physics. That's the course I wanted to teach. Because that's the course, I wanted to be like a missionary. I was so excited about finding out that everything connects in a beautiful way, we call that science, that I wanted to share that with the class. And who better to share it with, with people who haven't gotten that realization yet, and maybe you can light their fire and give them something. It's like saying, the place is on fire. It's important. So I prepared like a madman for those, those classes. Now here's the way I figured it. I've been through six years of formal training as a student. I took an awful lot of physics courses. I've got a class for 16 weeks. Ooh. I've learned a lot of physics in the, those six years, not as much as I learned maybe six years after that and six years after that. One of the wonderful things about teaching is you keep learning. But anyway, my thinking was, I've got to compress everything I know into 16 weeks. Every one of those lectures has got to be important. It's got to have something of value. And I found out something that was no big discovery to me, is that students really value understanding what the lesson's about. And so I did have a knack for explaining. And so I would just explain, explain, explain. And I found out that students found that most enjoyable, to sit in a class and find out, hey, I understand this stuff because there's nothing more enjoyable than finding out that you understand more than you thought you would understand. I'm at the lake one time and people are skipping rocks across the lake. Boom, boom, boom. And someone says, hey, I know a guy last, week, last year. He got nine skips. You pick up a rock. Ten skips. Hey, how do you feel about yourself? You feel good. You didn't think you were going to get 10 skips, and you did. And it feels nice when you find out that you understand more than you thought you were going to understand. And of course, I had it made because I was teaching physics. And physics has a reputation of being the killer course. So anything you can do to teach a class where understanding takes place without challenging them too much and beating over the head and belittling and all that sort of thing. Anything you can do to lift that understanding, wow. So the students enjoy the course. Now, another thing. Uh, a lot of people think that in teaching, it's our duty to challenge the student. When I've been teaching introductory courses like conceptual physics, I never felt the need to challenge anybody. All I wanted to do was to light their fire, let them feel that, hey, this is something worthwhile. I understand more now than I thought I was going to, and I feel good about that. And I feel good about physics. So what do they leave with? They leave with a nice flavor that, hey, wow, this, is, this was nice. Everything is connected. And of course, that's the way I always taught physics, is the connections of nature. In fact, physics is a study of those rules, the rules of how everything is connected. 
Now, when I was teaching in the 60s and then in the 70s, there was a lot of hue and cry about courses becoming relevant, not becoming relevant, that a course would have to be relevant to be valued. And if the course wasn't relevant to the students' everyday life, they were wasting their time. And there was a lot of rebellion across the river there in Berkeley about courses being relevant. Well, what could be more relevant than the rules by which all the physical things around us are connected? If you don't understand the rules of any game, you can't appreciate the game. Game of chess, checkers, computer game, party game. If you're watching people play some game, sports game, and you don't know the rules of the game, you, you, you can't really participate in a meaningful way as to what the game is about. You, 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 it's not for you. Well, there's rules of life. In, in physics, it's the rules of the physical part of life, physical things around you. And to go through life and not be acquainted with those rules and call yourself educated? No way. So students realized that, hey, this is important stuff. Now I know why the sky is blue. Now I know why the water is blue. And why when it tumbles over the rocks, the little parts are white. And why the clouds are white. And why the stars shine. And why everything is round up there, gravity pulling the corners. And how everything's falling. The satellites are falling all the time. Even the stars, you look at the fixed stars, they're not fixed, they're all falling around the center of the galaxy. And to, to find out how all this is working, whoo, it's wonderful. So I taught that kind of thing. And I didn't teach the standard course, which is a <clears throat> applied mathematics. But most physics courses would be really a course in problem solving, how to solve problems, and da da da, roll up your hands. Or an instructor say, look, I don't like this any more than you do, but let's begin. You know? <laughs> I mean, that type of thing. <clears throat> I remember when I first come here, I, I went to a party, a brand new faculty. And I was first, first year here. I went to a party in someone's house, and all these teachers were there, and we're all drinking, having a good time. And one of the teachers was a little bit soused, and he said, come on, let's be honest. We're, we're really in this for the money now. Don't kid ourselves. And he looked at me. And I looked at him. I didn't say anything. But he could see in, in my eye that, oh, well, <laughs> in it for the money. My God, it's a way of life. Talk about caregiving, nursing, medical, teaching. It's a way of life. You can lift people. Because in the classroom, you've got power. When that class begins, you close the doors. Honey, you're in charge. And you have power over those students. They will grovel to you. I remember one time <clears throat> looking out my window up in S-170, where I, <clears throat> my office, and seeing a student walk up and approach a professor was walking out. And the student says, uh, Mr. So-and-so, do you have our exams back yet? He said, no, 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 I told you I'll get those, to get to those when I can. Oh, no, no, I, I'm not trying to hurry you or anything. I just want... And I thought that student ought to say, you ought to get those out. <laughs> student couldn't say that. Power. So you always have to be nice to the teacher. <laughs> Teachers live in a kind of a privileged world. Our clientele is always nice to us. We have the power of the grade. Don't abuse that power. It's easy to do. I taught over in the University of Hawaii. Oh, by the way, you got this teacher program here. I wish that was in, I wish that was in, 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 in the works when I was here, because I've always felt it would be nice to teach teachers. I never have. But when I was in Hawaii, I did teach a course, Conceptual Physics for Teachers. And although the people who were my students were actually teachers in high schools, most of them. And I found out what the difference is between a strong teacher and a weak teacher. And what the difference is, 
is that the weak teacher doesn't have a sense of what is central. And so I found that out when I said, I want you to help me make these little practice sheets. It's a little sheet where you take the students and take them from here to here, and there's a little lesson. So everyone's got to do one of these practice sheets for part of the course. And there were very few of these practice sheets. When I looked at it, I said, what do they want the student to do that for? It's not important. It's a lot of busy work. I remember one time, I guess it was Ernest Hemingway, was, was, was someone grabbing the microphone. What makes a good writer? And he said, uh, you've got to have a good crap detector. And then he walked away. <laughs> if you're going to be a good writer and you're going to write, you have to have a good crap detector. You've got to know what's crap and what isn't. And the only way you can do that when you're teaching a subject is to know your subject. So the idea that it's uh, very, very important if you're teaching a subject, you've got to know your subject. But another thing, there'll be some times when a question will be asked and they're hitting a hole in your knowledge. Who here has no holes in their knowledge? Stand up. I want to see what you look like. <laughs> we all do. I still do in elementary physics. But when someone, for you people that are going to be teachers, there's going to be times when a student is going to ask you a question and you won't know the answer. And it may be to a question that maybe you ought to know the answer. So what do you do? You fake it. And you know what? The students won't be able to tell. <laughs> so you fake it. I'm lying to you. The students can tell. <laughs> never, never fake it. Don't do that. You're not kidding anybody. And all the respect that you have built up through all your study of your discipline and all the preparation you've done and all the respect you built up will fall down in one swoop when they say, He's faking it, and that's it. You don't recover from that. You'll never recover from that, except in our business, it's built in that you do recover from it, because 16 weeks later, there's a new group, <laughs> and you can start all over again. You wipe the slate clean, but along the way, don't, it's better to say, you know, I don't know the answer to that. And someone says, well, you should know the answer to that. They're not going to say that because you've got the grade book. <laughs> <laughs> they should say that. <clears throat> I remember one time I was teaching the course not too long ago. And the student asked me something. I came back. I said, yeah, I don't know that. He says, well, you should know that or something like that. How come I know that and you don't know that? I said, well, you're, you're, you're likely more intelligent than I am. And it's true. The guy was a lot brighter than I am. And I, I acknowledge that in class. The response of the rest of the class was, ooh, what is this? Realize in your classes, there's always going to be people there who are more intelligent than you are. Where your edge is, is you will be more knowledgeable than they are. You will be less ignorant than they are. But there will always be people brighter than you. How do you handle that? There's nothing to handle. You applaud it. How many teachers will cut a person down to size? So they can, oh, what, isn't it terrible for someone who has an arrogant personality to become a teacher? <laughs> oh. Is there anyone here in here that's predisposed to being arrogant who's thinking about becoming a teacher? Stand up. Stand up. I want to see you. <laughs> oh, good. thank God. Okay, that'd be great. Isn't that terrible? Because, boy, you could oh, make life miserable for so many people. Most of my teaching skills I learned by deciding what not to do when it was my turn. And one of the pet peeves I had 
I'd study, study, study this particular subject to find out it's not even on the exam. And oftentimes it was a matter of luck as to whether you study the right material or not. And if you could out the instructor, see what he's going to do, what he's not going to do. I think it's very good, like when a student says, is this going to be on the exam? Now, what does the typical instructor think about a student that asks that question? High or low? It should be high. Because if it's not going to be on the exam, it's not worth your while. Our brains can only take so much. We learn what we need to know, and we ignore the rest. I'm sorry. That's the way we're wired. So when a student says, is this going to be on the exam? If it's important, you say, yes, it'll be on the exam. That means you ask a lot of questions. But it's good to cover everything that you feel is important. All of it to reward people who have studied that way. And huh? Here's another thing, too, I learned. In undergraduate school, there was a teacher that I loathed. And it was mainly because that professor would give exams that would be so far away from anything we were covering in class that they were like intelligence exams, really. And we had three hot shots in the class, and they always got the high score. But when they get their high score, it turned out to be 40%. And the rest of us were down on the noise level. I rebelled. I went to the department chairman. This is, this is not right. And it's not right. Those of you who are going to be teachers, if you have a class and it's your opinion based upon interaction with these students that there are students in there who will end up getting an A in your class, then you have a responsibility to write an exam where those students score between 95 and 100. And if you write an exam so those students score 45 or 50, and you say, well, I'll take care of it later, you're like playing God with them, and that's not nice. If you're going to say 90's an A or 85's an A, make your exam so that people score that. If they don't, your exam is off. And I delighted in my last few years teaching here, and I was teaching the, uh, the course for... Uh, calculus-based and algebra-based course, which was a little more <coughs> serious than the conceptual in that it led to other courses and they had to get the information. And I'd say, if no one gets 100, the exam won't count because someone's got to get 100 in here. And I hit it on the mark, and there were people who got 100. And that's good. That gives, a, that gives a sense of satisfaction that the exam is fair. If the honchos in the class don't get 100, then what are you doing? So make your exam that way. Doesn't mean it has to be a giveaway. If everyone gets 100, it's a poor exam. You know about that. But you have to set it up so that there's, you don't have to fudge it later on. Nobody likes the fudging process later on. It, 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 it's insecure. It makes you insecure. What does it take to make students like you? What does it take to make students respect you? Those are two different questions. When I was an undergraduate, we had two professors that taught math, Mr. Ouellette and Mr. Flanagan. And Mr. Ouellette was one of these guys with almost no personality. He was almost like a robot. And we'll let, and, and Mr. Flanagan it was different. Mr. Flanagan was always letting us know the hardships of being a student and how you needed to keep trying. And he was sort of like doing a public relations with his image. Willette had no time for that. Willette would start every class the same way. All right, any questions on yesterday's homework? We'll get 10 minutes for that.
da, 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 da. He'd get on the board and methodically go through and solve the problems. Wow. Then he gets through. All right, now, for our lesson for today. Blah, 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 blah. He'd go right through, lay out his lecture. At the end, I'll give you one sample problem for tomorrow. Whoop. Class is dismissed. Mr. Flanagan, on the other hand, was Mr. Wonderful. We had student ratings of the teachers. Mr. Willette came in first. Mr. Flanagan was way down there. What people want out of you is good, clear instruction. It's clear, correct. That's what they want. They want to leave you knowing, hey, he's cleared it up for me. I was reading it. I didn't get it. Even at City College here, we had a teacher in the science department who was very student-oriented. Everyone loved him. And they had student-based ratings. And he got a terrible low score. It almost killed his spirit. It's too bad because he was, didn't realize that he wasn't really delivering. And being Mr. Nice Guy wasn't where it's at. When you're a teacher, you're there to instruct, to lay things out clear, concise, unambiguous, lifting, so the students get it. It's connected. That comes with your skill and with your preparation. And this fellow in the science department, if he had got that warning earlier, he might have corrected his ways and became a great teacher. There's some teaching tips. And these teaching tips, if anyone wants a copy of these, I'll give you the exact copy. My email is pghewitt at aol.com. G stands for Gordon. But what they are basically is trying to synopsis of what can I say to people who want to begin teaching in terms of do's and don'ts. And number one is, is your attitude. You've got to have an attitude that you're there to help the students. You're not there to be their master, but you're there to be their helper. And you've got to feel that you're serving the students. One thing not to do is to be aware that you become a know-it-all. If your position is to show the students that how clever you are, and how much you've learned, and you get their respect by being Mr. Know-it-all, it's going to go the other way on you. No one respects that. I remember a very skilled teacher who was teaching biology, and uh, she was told by her department chairman that she'd have to teach conceptual physics. This is up in Oregon. Ooh, she says, I can't teach physics. She's very skilled with the students. No, you've you got to teach the physics. So next semester, she came into class, and she says, students, I'm not a physics type. I'm in charge. I'm going to teach this course. I'm going to learn it with you. She says, but one thing I like is I like you to ask questions. When you're in my biology class, I really, really want you to ask questions. Well, that's my style. I want you to do it here. And if I don't know the answers, I hope we can still be friends. And so she encouraged people to ask questions. And not knowing the answer to some of the questions, her response would be, well, what is it that we don't know that we ask this question? What is it we'd have to know to be able to answer it? Where would we start? How would we know if we're on the right track? And she found out that was so successful that she did that with her biology students. So you as a teacher, you are not a reservoir of knowledge who when a hand goes up, you brrrr, there it is. They get that on the, on the website now, so on the, the, the internet, so quickly. Don't be that kind of person. Be a guide on the side, not a sage on the stage.
When students don't do well on an exam, give them a chance to try it again. If they hand in even a homework assignment, it's not good, say, I don't think I'd like to grade this. I'd like to give it back to you and take your time on it and give it back. I don't want to grade that because it's going to lower your score. So do it again. Now, you know what that means? That's more work for you. And the students know that. And when you say you can take a retake as many times as you want, they know that's not the easiest route for you. It's pretty clear. But when they find out the name of the game is not the easiest route for you, but to lift to them. You've got a class. You've got a class of students that you want to have. And you can pull those strings. You go and you make that extra effort. You know why? Because it's your life. And your life is pretty much defined by what you do for a living. So you got to be nice to you. And you'll be nice to you when you're nice to them. And I think when people start to become, to get into teaching, I think most of them, high-spirited, goodwill, they want to do well. They want to succeed. They want to be a good teacher. They want it when they walk into the room, they want the students to all have a smile on their face instead of the students saying, oh, God, yes, it's him. They don't want that. Every teacher wants to be good. But what happens if you're not? What happens if you flub up and somehow everything goes wrong and pretty soon the students don't really enjoy being in your class? They'd rather be in that other person's class if there is another person. What then? Well, what happens sometimes is then there's an adversarial thing happens. You still have the power. You've got the book. They're not liking what you do so much. You tighten up. And before you know, that idealism that you had when you started gets snuffed out, and you become a hard ass. And then you go in the coffee room, and you talk about how the students aren't understanding what you're saying, and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. It can go that way. To keep it going that way, keep it from going that way, again, I advise you do what I did. You prepare out the giggy. You stay up at night. You get everything all cascaded. You get good information. You get information that's central to what the topic is you're talking about, not peripheral. Central stuff, the stuff that they need to know if they understand it. You cascade it, and you explain it to the best of your ability. Nowadays, you can use these clicker things, and you can turn it into a Socrates questioning type thing, where you get them involved. But if they learn from you, they will love you. I was teaching Harvey White's Descriptive College Physics, and it was a good book. He's from... Berkeley. But he had some derivations in there and some places where there was a little, a little more mathematical than I wanted it to become. And first of all, I should say, the physics course I teach, I've always taught, is very mathematical, but non-computational. There's a difference. Mathematical in that things connect, inverse, direct, that sort of thing. One thing gets bigger, the other gets smaller twice as far away, one-fourth the effect. These are all mathematical ideas that the students could do. What they couldn't do is the algebraic problem solving. And for 16 weeks, I didn't do that. But the book I was using was filled with that. So I had to write my own book. And so the summer of 69, that's when the men went to the moon, I wrote conceptual physics. I wrote it in one summer. And someone here, oh, I autographed a copy of it, 
has it today. Yeah, it is right there. And that book sold for, I think, $4.20. <laughs> and uh, the, I got no royalty for it. And, it. and that was the expense of the paper and the book, da, 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 da. But anyway, it was in the bookstore, and there were a 1,000 of them because I had big classes. And uh, book publishers came by, and they saw all these books in the bookstore all piled up. It was rather thick. And I uh, said, who's this guy signed with? And Dick Main, the bookstore manager, said, oh, no, no, this is, a, this is a very, very local book. And I felt it was a very, very local book because I wrote the, that book for my students here at City College. I didn't write that book for other professors to look at. It wasn't for that. Like I say, when I put my feet up on the desk and say, I've made it, I've escaped a lot of the working class. I'm now a professional. I'm a community college physics teacher. I had reached the top of the ladder. And one time a student asked me, are you going to go for your PhD? Oh, I don't have a PhD gang. Can we still be friends? <laughs> yeah. I had a wife and three kids, and they're hungry, and I started teaching here at 34 years old. But anyway, let me get back to the book. So the book, turns out, ended up being published. And I didn't think it would be published because I didn't do what other books did and have the students solve all these problems, see how clever they could be with their algebra. And there's so many physics teachers who say, you know what, I can teach the math better than the math teachers. And they do. And I always ask, will the math teachers teach the physics that you didn't have time for? <laughs> no. Well, where are they going to get the physics? Well, uh, they're going to get the math. They've been getting the math since the fourth grade. Why don't you just teach physics? Oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> Whatever. So the book came out. And the book came out at a good time because the name of the book was Conceptual Physics, A New Introduction to Your Environment. And that's what it is. Your environment is the physical world. And this is the rules of the physical world. This is relevant with a capital R, so it turned out the book was a bestseller right from the beginning. Whoop! And it's been bestselling, and now it's in 12 languages. It's all over the world. And what it is, I just write as clearly as I can to make everything clear and connect everything to something they already know. And I didn't really realize that until someone told me, you know, your, your book is just a bunch of analogies. Oh, well, I've always taught that way. I mean, that's the way it is. So if you have any idea that you're going to hope to teach, find out where the kids are with respect to the idea and something they know, hinge on that, and then go up. And when they go up, they enjoy it. That's why the book is selling so many copies. Because they read it, and they say, I got it. It's cleared it up. It wasn't clear to me when I was an undergraduate. It wasn't clear to me at all. I didn't know what I was doing. When I got my bachelor's degree, I said, geez, I hope no one asked me any questions in physics. Because <laughs> I don't know any physics, man. Now, if they give me some problems, oh, I get pretty good at that. I can set up the problem to do that. You guys give me a little knack, a little art of problem solving. But don't ask me any physics questions. So that was missing. And even in graduate school, it was missing. But I started getting in graduate school when I started teaching conferences. And even when I came here, I would do some derivations in my physics 10. It wasn't appreciated. I stopped that quickly. And pretty soon I was teaching all the ideas as I'm talking about. Now, wrote this book after being teaching here for five years. And the book became a, an enormous success, which I never, never dreamed of. I thought that when I got the idea out, that if people hate doing math problems, why don't you try some physics without the math problems? Oh, I never thought of that. But it's that simple. And I thought, once I get the idea out there, the professionals will come and wipe me off the map. Well, lo and behold, it turned out I was that professional all the time. I didn't know it. And now it's in the 10th edition. So, wonderful story. And then helping me do that, I'm proud to say that my daughter, Leslie, 
I didn't send my daughter Leslie to some other. She came here to City College, honey. You know why she came to City College? To get the best education, right here. So she came here, right on. I hope my grandson's gonna come here next year. But you know one of the things I liked about City College? And I understand it's still the case. Now you know the people that come in to our school get an assessment of where their gray matter skills are. And then do the same thing with Berkeley. Guess who's higher? Begins with a B. UCB. Yeah, Berkeley. Okay. So Berkeley starts off with a higher ability clientele. But here at City College, we send a lot of students after two years across the river to Berkeley. And guess how they do? Well, you know how they do. They outperform the Berkeley students. Now, what's that tell you? That tells you City College is the place to get your first two years of school, or maybe three years. It's a wonderful place. The best teaching is here. And when I get a degree of fame with this book, even with a master's degree, I could teach anywhere I wanted. I did. I taught over at UC Berkeley. I taught at UC Santa Cruz, Hawaii. I was invited at these places to stay as a lecturer, not a professor. No. I wanted to come here because I had colleagues that were wonderful, 14 physics people, and every one of them, when I was here, could have the same, had the same thing in their background that was going to be a strong component of their being a good teacher. And that was, and we had four with PhDs from big institutions, we all had something in common. Every one of us had flunked a physics course <laughs> when we were students. I flunked mine, electricity and magnetism, my sophomore year. I was oh, terrible. I, you know why I flunked it? I didn't understand it. And it caught up with me. And I had to take it again. And when I took it again, the professor told me, I think you'll profit by taking it again. He was right. And it's always been like a strong part of my, my physics knowledge since. Everyone had flunked a course. Now, if any of you people are thinking of becoming teachers and you haven't flunked a course, get into something else. Don't be a teacher. Because there'll be times when you have to give an F. And if you don't know what it feels like, you haven't earned the right to give an F. So do something else. How many people here have flunked a course in, in, their, in, in, in their life? Show of hands. Hooray! Hooray! Look at those people with their hands are down. Look at them with the people with their hands are down. Snuff them. Don't eat with them at lunch. <laughs> Anyway, Leslie went on to get a degree at uh, San Francisco State, wonderful place, geology, geologist now, and she helped me write conceptual physical science. This is about in the <clears throat> early 90s, and that's now in its third edition, where it's physics, chemistry, and uh, 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 earth science. And my nephew, John Sohaki, he did the chemistry part, and uh, so it's sort of like a family type fair. And we've just written a new book uh, that I'm only peripheral to. It's called Conceptual Integrated Science, coming out in July. And it's got biology in it. But I've been doing a lot of writing ever since the early 70s and polishing these books over and over and over again. And I enjoy doing that. I enjoy making it clearer and clearer and clearer. And when my first book came out, I dedicated it to the struggling student. Because when I was in school, I struggled. I'm 28 years old, competing with these 18-year-old hotshots. Physics, the killer course. And it was hard for me. And when I looked at it all, I found out, you know, it's not really that hard. In fact, of all the sciences, it's the simplest. Not by a small margin, 
by an enormous margin. Physics is the simplest of the sciences. It's so well understood that we expect the students to understand it right away. Chemistry, more complex. Biology, whoo. Look at the summary of terms in any book. At the end of every physics chapter, six or seven terms. Chemistry chapter, double that. Biology, triple that. Biology is so complex. Why is it then that physics is the killer course and biology is the easier science course? Maybe it's the way it's taught. Maybe they don't dig the plow down so deeply. You know, with the difficulty of a course, it doesn't have to do with the field. It has to do with how deep does the instructor put the plow setting in that field. You could make basket weaving the most difficult and feared course here at City College. Basket weaving. And the counselors could say to the students, watch out for basket weaving. <laughs> Unless you have very nimble fingers and a lot of patience and a lot of aptitude for that, watch out for basket weaving. Because what you have to do in the final is you have to make a basket in 90 minutes that has to look well. An instructor will come by and pour water in there. And if it leaks, you flunk. And you'll have to take the course again. And the instructor will say, yes, you'll take it again, but you'll profit by it. <laughs> and so basket weaving could be the most difficult course in school. Oh, and then there's that other course. It teaches you why the satellites don't fall, how the rules of nature are all connected, why the stars shine, and all those type of things. Now that course, you've got to stand in line to get to that one, because that's a very popular course. Why can't it be like that? So the killer course, no. Physics is not called the killer course anymore. It's called the delightful course of nature's rules. Yeah, how did I get interested in all this anyway? Why did I start going to school at 28? Or why not 18? Well, I got some advice that wasn't so good in high school. It turned out I've always had a talent for drawing. And in high school, it was known that I could draw because I drew for the little newspaper, little cartoons. And my high school counselor, when I met my counselor, advising what I should do, I remember the counselor saying, Hewitt, you won't have to take, you won't have to take any of the academic courses because you're going to be a cartoonist, you're going to be an artist. So I didn't. I didn't take any math, I didn't take any chemistry, didn't take any physics, didn't take anything. Metal, metal shop, a wood shop, keyboarding, best thing I did. But I went through high school without taking any academic courses. And certainly not science. We did, have the, we did have a science course in the ninth grade it's called General Science, and it was a little mishmash of everything. And, but it didn't inspire me to, to go further. So I became a cartoonist, and I didn't do very well at that. I became a sign painter. I did pretty well at that. And I worked painting signs. And I was in Boston at the time. Have any of you ever painted signs in Boston in the wintertime on the shady side of the street, outdoors? <laughs> it's a bummer. The paint gets gooey, and you've got to put it on. No, no, no. I went to Miami <laughs> and down to Florida. And down in Florida, I was lucky enough to get a job with Webster Outdoor Advertising. And uh, get the job, I was told, okay, well, you're going to have to paint with this fellow here, Burl Gray. Okay. And I found out none of the other guys wanted to paint with Burl Gray. And I was just hired, and I got to paint with Burl. Because they were saying things about Burl, that he was, uh, you know, one of them. You know what I'm talking about. 
and uh, no one wants to paint with one of them. You see, Boer was accused of being, and I found out firsthand it was correct, Burl was accused of being an intellectual. Oh, yeah. You want to paint signs with an intellectual? No way, honey. Intellectuals talk about ideas all day long. Puzzles. Now, the real guys talk about sports, cars, and their fantasy sex lives. Now, who do you want to paint with, huh? Anyway, I had to paint with Burl Gray. And I'm painting with Burl, and Burl was an intellectual who uh, uh, didn't, go to, didn't graduate high school. He went into the Army, World War II. Burl Gray is now 83, alive and well. And uh, <clears throat> Burl chatted with me about ideas that just enthralled me. What would happen if this? What would happen to that? What would happen to this? He got me so interested in ideas. It's the first intellectual person I had met. Got me all revved up. And then he introduced me to a friend of his who was sort of like his guru. And his name was Jacques Fresco. And Jacques Fresco was one of these guys that would say, there, there, everything will be all right if we employ the teachings of science and technology. One of these guys, a guru. Oh my God, he lit my fire. Well, Jacques Fresco, last I heard, he's down, he's working with CNN in Atlanta. He's doing a new movie about the future. Jacques Fresco was a futurist. One of these guys, a visionary. A wonderful guy. And I think the best teacher on the planet. So I got some, I saw what good teaching is, was with Jacques Fresco. And Fresco and Burl got me all revved up. Oh boy, I wanted to, I knew I wanted to do in life now. I want to become a scientist. Because I believe what Fresco said, that we'll have a better world if people will be more scientific and use the engineering to lift the human condition. So I wanted to be one of those people. I knew I wanted to teach because I saw that none of these people were teaching like Jacques Fresco. I want to be like Jacques Fresco. Now, what do you got to do to teach? Well, you have to have a master's degree. Okay. I went with my wife, two kids. Went to Colorado, where she's from. Oh, I couldn't get in. Last minute, I couldn't get in. But I could get into Utah State. So they took me to Utah State. And I spent two years there and got a master's degree. One in physics and one in science education. And from there, I came over to here. But had I not bumped into Burl Gray, who got me enthused about this, I would probably have a submarine sandwich shop today, because I was interested in making submarine sandwiches, uh, or a sign painting shop. But that one individual tipped the direction of my life. 